Welcome to Brookfield Perspectives, the podcast from Brookfield that explores how the firm invests in the backbone of the global economy. What do we mean by that? The things that you interact with every day that you may not even think about, like wind turbines, water treatment facilities, cell towers, and office buildings. Investing in these critical assets helps support and accelerate the pace of progress in businesses and communities around the world. I'm Lauren Steffi, and I've been writing about investing in financial markets for the better part of three decades. I'll be your guide as we meet the business leaders at one of the world's largest alternative asset managers. We'll talk about how to spot trends early, what it takes to turn contrarian ideas into opportunities, and how to uncover the next great company. And we'll go on site where the rubber meets the road at innovative companies and projects around the globe. Our current arc of the series covers digitalization and how it's touching different sectors of the economy. In this episode, we'll unpack what's driving the digital investment renaissance in groundbreaking technologies across sectors and regions around the globe. My guests today are Doug Bayard, managing partner for Brookfield's private equity business and head of technology investment, and Jingwen Liu, senior vice president of business operations at Brookfield. I kicked off the conversation by asking Doug to explain the difference between digitization and digitalization. Digitization, that's really the process when you convert physical or analog information into a digital format. Digitalization would be adapting a system or a process which would be operated by computers in the internet. Digitization would be if I took a physical business card from a prospect and then I retyped it into my online address book. I just digitized that information and I don't have to rummage around a shoebox to find it if I want the number. Whereas digitalization, really I look at it as a next step. Think of software that would actually alert me to the fact that I haven't called that prospect in quite some time and it actually creates a calendar invite so that I could talk to that person in the coming days. I've now digitalized my outbound calling effort. So given that distinction, Yingwen, tell us a little bit about how this affects businesses globally. Today, the amount of data created annually is about 60 times the amount in 2010. And that supports the example of digitization. We're collecting a lot more data than we used to before. Public cloud computing supports digitalization, which is the usage of software and technology to enable ways of working. This is also expected to double by the time we reach 2030, so there's tremendous growth ahead. I'd say we are seeing digitalization creating significant operational value creation opportunities for many companies, not just MPE. The opportunity can be both external or internal. Internal includes everything that helps a business improve their efficiency, such as leveraging automation to replace manual work or rewiring complex processes and making them really simple to improve performance. Externally, digitalization can also enable creation of new customer experiences, such as e-commerce solutions or even new products derived from data that was previously uncaptured. Let me just ask if you could give us maybe a couple of examples or like an internal and an external example of this. In terms of new offerings created from data that didn't exist, Nielsen, which is a portfolio company, is using big data from smart TVs and set-top boxes to forecast how audiences engage with different types of content. So A, it's collecting more data than it did before that never existed. And then B, it's now using machine learning to create prediction to forecast out what type of audiences may be watching what type of programming. And in turn, this product can help content creators and advertisers to make better decisions. And I guess Nielsen, that's the company we all know of. They've been around forever. This is the Nielsen ratings that we've heard about on TV. You got that right. Doug, let's talk a little bit about other tools that are enabled by digitalization and if there's any other examples. In terms of digitalization, which is really bringing software into a process, is how I simplify it. It's not the end-all be-all. If you have a broken process, digitalizing that process just continues a broken process. It doesn't all of a sudden make it work. And so I think that's a key misconception that a lot of businesses have if they're 
customer service isn't going well, well, I'll just digitalize it. I'll buy a software program and that'll make it better. And the reality is that there's most likely some fundamental breakdown in their process that's caused them to have bad customer service. Bringing on even the most expensive or latest software set isn't going to change that. Once I have a process that works, I can think about what is the software that's going to be the most effective for me and making sure that all the stakeholders on the business side really are aligned. That's critical in order to make sure you buy the right product that's really solving the issue at hand for your company. And I think where we've seen in portfolio companies and outside where this is broken down is because either the stakeholders have a different view of what problem they're trying to solve or I'm trying to buy software to solve a fundamental system breakdown. Isn't that a common problem with technology? I mean, historically, companies that try to embrace new technology often think it's going to be a one-size-fits-all solution regardless. Absolutely. And that's why before you even start looking at different software or vendors, you have to take a time on the front end to understand what is that problem I'm trying to solve? How big are the customers? If it's customer service, how big are the customers I'm trying to service? What's my touch points? Is it voice? Is it digital? Is it online? How am I actually providing that service and making sure I have a very detailed breakdown of what it is I'm trying to accomplish and a breakdown of my process today? And then using that in order to determine what's the right vendor for me. And I think a lot of times people try to do it the opposite way, which is, hey, I heard that Salesforce is a great CRM, which is a customer relationship manager. Let's go buy Salesforce. Well, it may not be the right CRM for you, depending on how you actually approach your customers. I think people get that backwards. So, Yang Wen, let me ask you, from the operating side, once the software is installed, what changes do you see once they actually get things in place? I would say even before the software is installed, the way we like to help companies think about digital transformation and create for a successful transformation is to craft a clear strategy up front focused on the business value or the customer value they want to drive to design the right set of processes enabled by the right tools to deliver or achieve that value is super important up front. And then Often we want to make sure that they have the right talent to enable that to happen and a good change management process to help transition from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. After the transition is done, often it's paired with an operating model that can then scale it across greater initiatives enterprise-wide. What we typically do is take a small use case or a small part of the business and run a PLC, a means proof of concept. Work out all the change management aspects of the transformation. Figure out the playbook of how to scale that enterprise wide. We like to use the word go slow to run faster later. That's typically how we approach it from an operational perspective. Doug, how does this influence how we think about investments in technology as we move down this road to digitalization? How does it change how companies think about this or how we approach it? We look for companies where their software is really the infrastructure of businesses. The way we define that is it's truly a mission-critical product, and that product is used in the daily workflow of the end user. So this is something that you or I, as part of our job, that software is integrated into our process. The reason why we look for those types of businesses is because they're very difficult to rip out and replace. Even if there's another competing product that comes out that has a slightly better interface or is slightly cheaper, I'm just not going to replace what I have with that new product because regardless of how much it costs in terms of the dollars, I also have to retrain my entire staff. If you're selling to an enterprise customer, that gets very expensive and difficult. That's where we really focus our efforts from an investing standpoint. A good example would be, say, Microsoft Excel versus Google Sheets. They're both spreadsheet software. Google Sheets is free. Microsoft Excel costs a significant amount of money. However, you don't see financial firms migrating from Excel to Google Sheets because I would have to retrain every single person in that firm on how to look at a Google Sheet, how to build a spreadsheet. It would be immensely difficult and tremendous amount of upheaval at that firm. And cost is almost irrelevant at that point. You can imagine we really like that dynamic as investors. 
that's the first step for us. And then it's also looking to invest in areas of technology where we think we have a differentiated knowledge base. And that really comes from the fact that we have, if not tens of billions, hundreds of billions invested in certain verticals. And that's invested in dozens of companies. And those companies are customers of technology vendors. So we have the voice of the customer actually in-house across the 300 portfolio companies within Brookfield. That is a true differentiated pool of knowledge that we can dip into and distill down to whatever type of software we're looking at investing in and have a differentiated view as to whether or not it is a market leader. Is it truly mission critical? What are the growth opportunities? Because we're buying that software. And so we think that gives us a really unique insight relative to other potential investors. So I want to try to get some examples of some companies that are leading the charge here. Yingwen, you already talked to us about Nielsen, but is there another example you can give us of a company that's at the forefront of this? I could talk about CDK Global. That is a holistic, fully integrated software suite that sells to automotive dealers. And this is truly a system of record. So it's doing all the accounting for an automotive dealer. It digitizes all that data. It then has a pool of information that it uses to drive your accounting, but it also takes that data and it knows all your customers. It's your front end or your CRM. It then also connects to all the car manufacturers. I connect for inventory. So in order to accept cars, in order to sell cars, in order to provide customer repair, it does all my billing. So it is so essential. It's essentially, if our software goes down, you have to put a close sign on your automotive dealership that day. You cannot operate. So true example of mission criticality. And then that's to a point where every employee is also trained on this software, where a one ad within that dealership will say, you must be trained on CDK in order to apply for this position. That got us very comfortable with the digital journey that CDK takes their customers on is truly mission critical. And we do the space well through investments that we had within Brookfield and automotive. All right, Yingwen, you have another example for us? Another example I can think of is a company called Scientific Games. It is a provider of technology solutions and services to governments to run their lottery businesses. The company actually started primarily as the paper-based lottery business. It prints the tickets, scratch cards that you can buy from convenience stores. Over the years, it has expanded its product offering to include services and products like retail solutions, systems to manage player accounts, loyalty programs. One of the latest innovation is a suite called the iLottery solution or the digital lottery solution for governments. Players are increasingly looking to interact with lottery games online, governments are seeing the overall revenue increase from lottery when they've added these online games to the portfolio. They're complementary to the instant scratch cards that are already out there. If you are a player that bought a lottery ticket in a store and didn't win, they offer something called a second chance where you can enter into a game online and get another chance at winning something. So that's what we call an omni-channel solution. And we see tons of potential to create incremental revenue for governments around the world with programs like these. Interesting. So if you don't win the first time, you get another bite at the apple, as it were. Exactly. I'm guessing that with paper lottery tickets, you're sort of limited with what you can do, right? But when you move that into an environment of digitalization, you can do a lot of different things, pretty much anything you want. Yeah. In this case, with a company like Scientific Games, how does digitalization improve the customer experience? For Scientific Games, they offer a service that's used by many lottery governments, which is called the Player Account Management Service and the Loyalty Program Management Service. These are essentially services that help the governments to engage with their customers better, to give them a second chance, as the example that was provided earlier, and a callback or reactivation in some instances when they haven't played for a while. That's an example. Another one is a company in the Brookfield ecosystem called Boxed that primarily helps consumers fix their water boilers if something went wrong or get a water boiler replacement installed. 
the company has a completely digital experience when it comes to buying or fixing a new boiler. You can just go online. Within minutes, you can get an appointment booked and an installer will show up at your door almost the next day to come and fix your problem for you. They use all the interactions that a user has online, clicking through different pages and potentially dropping off on some pages to improve the customer journey that's in the product and help drive more customers to get to the completion page of seeing the products that are recommended to them and booking an appointment. They also leverage data to decide which products are most popular or most demanded in the market so they can stock the right products accordingly as well. I asked Doug to share another example of how digitalization is impacting Brookfield portfolio companies. In this case, a customer service outsourcing platform called Everize. Everize is a business process outsourcer, BPO for short. It provides their customers with outsourced customer service for the end user. So if you're calling about your healthcare bill, the number you call may actually send you to an Everize employee who provides you with service around that bill. I really think this is a perfect example of how digitalization leads businesses to re-examine the process altogether and really what are they good at doing. So as you're examining your processes and what you're good at, especially healthcare and technology firms have found that what they should focus on and what they're really good at is delivering care or delivering product to their customer. And perhaps they should outsource some of the other areas where they're not as good at to real professionals and leaders in those fields. Everize has benefited almost indirectly from a digitalization where people are just examining the processes and how their businesses are operating in general. Let's move on to a topic that everybody thinks about when we talk about technology these days, and that's AI. This is kind of a jump ball for whoever wants to jump in here, but how is AI changing all of these things we talked about? How is it going to continue to change business going forward? I think there are three fundamental drivers of change from AI, and I would bucket them into productivity gains, product innovation, and the third is value chain disruption. For the most part, I think AI will be used to augment the human workforce and drive better productivity and higher quality of output. An example is developers who are writing code today. There is a tool called GitHub Copilot that can help them complete their code as they type out a sentence much faster. There are also tools that allow refactoring of old computer programming language into newer programming language, that would all be tremendously time-saving from a productivity standpoint. The other power comes from the prediction that is brought by AI that could enable new ways of operating for companies or even new ways of interacting with customers. I think one example of that could be the search experience For those of us who grew up with Google search, it's very much a self-dictated search experience. I type in exact terms that I want to search for. But with generative AI, now I think we can be less specific about what we're searching for. We can have a bit of more of a conversation, even with the search engine, to get to the answer we're looking for. And it's less about seeing a list of results, but just seeing the conversation returned from the generative AI-assisted bot. And speaking of generative AI, I think that's been the latest buzz around the world ever since the launch of the OpenAI chat GPT last year. It is quite powerful and could be on par with humans for creative generation. For example, creating a painting or creating a drawing, we can now prompt the program to tell them create a cat sitting on a table drinking wine or something, and it can probably do that for you in a very creative way. That's a very interesting use case and could potentially disrupt the content generation or the creative generation industry to some degree. It's probably too early to tell what sectors could be impacted, but thematically we see AI being used both in an augmentation fashion and also in some ways changing how we use things or interact with things. Yeah, there's no question AI is going to change how businesses interact with the world. But I also think we have to be careful not to get ahead of ourselves. I don't think AI is going to take over the world. 
But I do think the businesses that are winners in the long term will incorporate AI into their processes. They'll incorporate AI into all aspects of their processes. From my perspective, it's sort of similar. We saw a wave of euphoria over IoT several years ago, and everything was going to go IoT. That is the Internet of Things, and essentially was shorthand for general connectivity between a machine and the user. But the reality was, if you were building a plane, you weren't going to buy your engines from an IoT company. You were going to buy them from Rolls-Royce, and Rolls-Royce is going to incorporate IoT into that engine. I think it's very similar here. You're not going to buy all your software or all your products from an AI company, but you're going to buy software that has AI incorporated in it because to Jing Wen's point, it will enable, it will, it will make it more productive and hence make the user more productive. That's the excitement for me around AI and chat GPT. So let's bring this home to Brookfield more directly. How is Brookfield using AI or applying AI in this private equity portfolio? I'd say it's impossible to go through a day without thinking about AI in the Brookfield context. We see a lot of opportunity in transforming core processes with the help of AI and automation. And the functions that we often look at transforming would be customer service operations, elements of marketing, such as the content generation side of marketing, software development, and knowledge management. We're pretty excited about the value creation benefits that exist commercially by changing the customer interaction touch points. We think the AI-driven chatbots or other AI-driven services could help us drive a lot more productivity out of the same number of people. One example I can give is the boxed company that I mentioned earlier. They have a ton of customer inquiries every day through their platform because they primarily have a digital experience. They implemented an AI-driven chatbot, and they're seeing that potentially up to 15% of the customer inquiries are resolved by self-help power with the chatbot. And that creates excess capacity as they grow to deal with some of the harder to address customer inquiries. So AI is not the pill for all types of inquiries. It doesn't resolve everything, but it can take the low complexity type of work away, which in turn creates a lot of capacity for the higher complexity work that requires more judgment and thinking. It's interesting. I would say that's actually similar going back to the very beginning when we were talking about digitalization. That's what software was doing, was taking some of that rote process and digitalizing it so that people who were doing that process could elevate and see a broader picture. And so you could make the case that AI is really the next evolution of that digitalization. So again, going back to businesses that adopt it, will be able to elevate above the competition, much like people that adopted software in the early days, we're able to elevate. We're talking about how this can be applied across a broad range of industries. And we're talking about things like chatbots and stuff, but then I believe Westinghouse is using it with predictive maintenance and that kind of thing, which ties back into the IoT stuff you were talking about. Westinghouse is a very interesting, I think, early adopter of AI. They started experimenting this a few years ago and turned it into a service that is now used by some utilities in North America. What they've done is, I think initially they have looked at some of the plant operations data that they get as part of their other product suites. And they looked at the maintenance cycles associated with the different pieces of equipment that they're a part of and as part of the data set that they're getting. And they created a predictive plant maintenance solution and built it as part of their maintenance solution as a service overall to help drive lower maintenance costs for the utility customers. And that results in not only lower costs, but also better operational performance and less downtime at the plant and so on. So early days, but this is a very promising solution that they've developed. I wanted to also talk about new frontiers that are opening up here. And Doug, I believe you had some thoughts about crypto and digital currencies, which has uh, certainly been in the news a lot lately. How does this all come together? <laughs> I don't know how it all comes together or how it ends, <laughs> but I can give you some thoughts on where we are in the journey. I think the first step whenever we talk about crypto is to separate the blockchain technology from Bitcoin and other 
coin-based units of measure. Blockchain is essentially a technology that is open source, so anyone can access it any time from any access point or different computers that are connected. So similar to the internet isn't in one specific point, but it's actually distributed. The blockchain is also distributed. The benefit of that is I can put actual deeds. I can put property rights, the documents in a blockchain and anyone can access from anywhere and see who owns that piece of property. That's tremendously valuable, especially in countries or areas where there isn't a central record keeper. That same blockchain Technology is used to create Bitcoin and used to create other crypto and digital tokens. From my perspective, those tokens and Bitcoin is really just essentially gambling because it's not based on a stream of cash flows. It's not based on any tangible measure of worth other than someone's willing to pay me $1,000 or $100,000 for that Bitcoin today. What have we learned about what happens in business more broadly with these massive advancements in digital technology? Are there broader takeaways from the dot-com boom or the rise of social networking that can give us some perspective on what to expect? One lesson is there's always an intrinsic value associated with something. And the further you get away from that intrinsic value, and intrinsic value should be based upon the cash flows that whatever it is you're buying can deliver you or the utility that that product can deliver to you. I think that we've seen, again, a rational exuberance, whether it be companies getting valued on the number of clicks during the dot-com boom. And it wasn't about revenue and profitability. It was about how many clicks came to my site or Again, I think what we saw in crypto was about how many influencers were telling you this was something that you should buy. It was more a marketing play than any intrinsic value associated with it. And so you see this irrational market where it's almost like FOMO, fear of missing out. And I see people, my cab drivers getting rich trading in Bitcoin, so I should be trading in Bitcoin and I'm missing on this land grab. That's where you see, again, from my perspective, people get ahead of themselves and Whoever's the last person holding the bag loses a tremendous amount of value. I do think there's always a silver lining. And what you see is anytime a tremendous amount of energy and capital is spent in a given area, there tend to be lasting value associated with it. And what I would mean by that is for every sock puppet or webvan.com that came out, there was an Amazon that rose from the ashes. The great telecom boom early in 2000, where people were investing in the actual plumbing of the internet, there was a big build it and they will come. Well, it was build it and go bankrupt, but those pipes still remained. And as demand for internet and bandwidth grew, the plumbing was already there. The infrastructure was already built. And so it allowed for a tremendous expansion of internet usage and bandwidth increase in the 2000s. As long as you don't get caught up in the exuberance and are the last person holding the bag or waiting until the music will stop, you can actually benefit, society can benefit from some of these sometimes irrational expenditures. So there's no hope for my NFT art. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To close out the discussion, I asked Doug and Jing Wen to share how digitalization is impacting their own day-to-day lives. Well, I would say on a personal note, I used chat GPT to write the last letter to my mom and she really liked it much better, (laughs) much better than anything I could have ever written. She called me and told me how great it was. I need to try that, except my parents would only expect me to write in Mandarin and I don't know how good chat GPT is in Mandarin. (laughs) But the other day I used chat GPT to fill out a bunch of Excel work that I would have otherwise had to spend five hours plus to do Googling each company on the list and classifying them into different industries and buckets. So that was a tremendous time saver for me. That's all for today's episode. Thanks to Jing Wen and Doug for sharing their perspectives. To hear more from business leaders at Brookfield and beyond, Check out our other episodes on decarbonization, deglobalization, and digitalization wherever you listen. And stay tuned for more from Brookfield Perspectives. Audiation.